Open your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Coming off of our resurrection message last Sunday, the Lord led my thoughts to a passage in Philippians chapter 2 that I think is very fitting to, to discuss as the message right after our discussion of Resurrection Sunday. So for sake of context, I would like to take the verses right before and right after those verses. And if we're able to get through all of that, we will finish verses 1 through 16. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Instead of reading all of them together, let me just read them verse by verse and take our commentary as we go. Verse 1, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercy, that's a good question. Is there any of it to be found? That Jesus died and rose from the dead? If it doesn't produce consolation in Christ, if it doesn't produce the comfort of love, if it doesn't produce the fellowship of the Spirit, if it doesn't produce the bowels or, or compassion and mercy, what has it accomplished? We who say we are redeemed by the blood of a resurrected Christ, where is our consolation in Christ? Where is our comfort of love? Where is our fellowship of the Spirit? Where is our bowels of compassion? Where are our mercies? Christian people today are among the meanest, most hate-filled, most angry people on the face of this earth. Our churches are filled with friction all over America discord, disharmony, hatred, jealousy, bitterness, everywhere, all over, all over America. I'm not just talking about one church here and there. I'm talking about all over America. Our churches are filled with bitterness and hatred, envy, jealousy, backbiting, gossip, slander, unkindness. Am I exaggerating or am I telling the truth? I'm, a, I'm telling exactly the truth. I would venture a guess that half the churches in America are in existence because the crowd that started the church split from another church that they were mad against. And their anger 
against whatever the church was caused them to split that church and go start another church. And then it's not too long that a group within that church gets mad, splits that church, and they go start another church. I know when I was pastoring the other church that I pastored for all those years down in Florida, we, start, we started a whole bunch of churches. <laughs> and hardly any of them were intentional. The spirit of anger permeates the so-called Christian community. Permeates it. If Christ's resurrection does not produce consolation in our hearts, does not produce love in our hearts, does not produce the fellowship of the Spirit in our hearts, does not produce spouse of compassion in our hearts, does not produce mercy in our hearts. What has it done for us? Was Christ's death in vain? Was his resurrection without merit? We who call ourselves by his name, who march under his banner, that we cannot have a heart of mercy and love and compassion and consolation, then what good did it do us. Amen. For the most part, the world doesn't hate the church or despise the church, might be a better word, because of the gospel message. No. No. For the most part, it hasn't been the gospel message that has turned the unsaved world against the church. It has been the spirit, the despicable, carnal, bitter spirit of Christians that has driven the unchurched away from the church. It has deafened their ears to the gospel. How can you preach the gospel of Christ with hatred in your heart? How can you do that? For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, you dirty reprobates! So many preachers are preaching the gospel as if they're hoping that people reject it and go to hell. I don't like to say what I'm about to say, but my personal experience over the last several years has been that for the most part, not exclusively, by any stretch of the imagination, but for the most part, people that are unsaved who have no Christian profession at all, by and large, are friendlier, kinder, and filled with more compassion and love than people that claim to be Christians in the church. That's my experience. That's my experience. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and I hate everybody. 
You know, the message of hate just doesn't communicate very well the gospel. It blinds people to the gospel. They can't hear the gospel because all they see is bitterness and envy and hatred and lying and hypocrisy and deceit and duplicity. And they see pastors who when, who when they come to controversial subjects don't have what it takes. Let's forget for a minute maybe to get up and actually say something that's controversial. Forget that. They don't even have the courage to study it. They won't even look at it. And people out here that God has put in their hearts a desire for truth. And there's a lot of unsafe people walking around that God has put in their hearts a desire for truth. And they go to the church and what do they find? They find a bunch of lies or they find a bunch of half-truths. And they find a cowardly pulpit and people and who, by the way, let's put, the, let's put, put it where the rubber reaches the roads. These pastors that are up there preaching all this prosperity stuff and this feel-good stuff and this non-controversial stuff. Listen, they wouldn't have a job. They wouldn't have a position if the people in the pew didn't want that. Where are the big churches at today? Where are the churches with the tens of thousands in attendance in the big empires, in the big cathedrals, in the, in the big men? Where are they? They're the ones that are standing up giving people nothing controversial. Because that's what people want. We have the kind of church people want. So where is it? This is Paul saying, look, if, there, if there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any bowels and mercies, what? Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Wow! What do you think could happen in America if the unsaved world could see a church as one in love with Christ, in love with each other, and in love with truth? I submit if the world saw that, we would have revival Tomorrow. The, the world is hungry for that. Hungry for it. They can't find it. And they've tried the church and they can't find it there either. Fulfill you my joy. That you be like minded. We may not agree on every nuance of every issue as a fellowship, but on the main issues of what brings this fellowship into existence, our love of God and our fear of God and our love of truth in the word of God and our love of liberty which God has given us in his word, when it comes to those essential interests and issues, each of us in this fellowship should be positively, solidly, like-minded of the same love of one accord and of one mind. If we can't do it, it's not going to happen. If it doesn't happen here, it's not going to happen. The darker this world gets, and it's getting darker by the moment, 
the brighter the light of truth emanating from this fellowship is going to glow. Why do you think so many, why are so many people following this little fellowship? Why are so many people interested in this little fellowship? I'm talking tens of thousands of people all over the, the, the country and the world even. Why should they care about what happens in little Kalispell, Montana, nestled here in the valley of the Rocky Mountains in northwestern Montana? Why would they care? Why would they take note? Why would they pray for this fellowship? Why would they give to this fellowship? Why would they write the kind of letters you hear every week to this fellowship? Why would they watch this fellow? Why would they do it? Because in their hearts, they are crying out for a fellowship that is united and together on the principles of Christ and the principles of truth and the principles of liberty. And they see that in us and they're saying to themselves, oh my God, I wish I could be part of that. I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to support that. I'm going to let that pastor know. I'm going to let that church know that I am there in spirit. That's why, and that's why I can get up and preach messages that are out of the box, that are not taught in the seminaries and the Bible colleges and by the mega church pastors and the televangelists and the Bible colleges, and I can reach into the scripture for myself and I can take what I find in the word of God in prayer and as it leads me through the word of God and I can come to conviction about what I believe is true especially as it relates to what's going on in our country today Amen. and I'm saying here's where God has led me and here's what I believe the Bible says and here's why and people around the country, even if they don't understand it right away, go, wow, I appreciate that. Thank you for challenging my mind. It resonates that you want to give me the truth. It resonates that it may be out of the box, but it's something that I need to, to study more about. It resonates that, you know what, Chuck? If you're willing to admit that you were wrong about believing such and such, you know what? I'm man enough, I'm woman enough, that if I can be shown to myself by my spirit and the Lord that I'm wrong on something, I'm man enough, and I'm willing enough, and I'm Christian enough to do it also. <laughs> Compare that to this robot religion we have today. Where that the only thing people hear, is that what they expect to hear? And the pastors give them nothing that they don't want to hear and nothing that he knows would challenge their thinking for fear of how they might react. And so, you know what we have in this country in our pulpits today in America? We have exactly what Jesus said. The blind are leading the blind and both are falling into the ditch of oppression and slavery. They're falling in the ditch. This country is in a serious, serious condition. And it's because the churches, the churches are not willing to entertain truth. If, if they don't understand it. If they don't understand it, they reject it out of hand. But if there's any group of people that should be able to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind, regarding the principles of Christ and truth and his word and the freedom principles that he's given us in his word, if there's any 
fellowship on the face of the earth that should be able to do what verse 2 says. It should be liberty fellowship. And I'm saying to the people here, let's make sure that we fulfill Philippians 2, 2. What do you say? Let me preach the truth as I understand it. Let me give you the reasons why. If it challenges your thinking, then get into the word yourself like the Bereans did of old and search the scriptures and see whether those things be or not. Study for yourself. Don't take my word for anything. Study the word of God for yourself. Come to convictions of the scriptures for yourself as to what you believe. Well, all I'm saying to you is that I've studied this issue now for several years. And when I first began recognizing the out-of-the-box character of these, of these truths, I, I did have a little bit of mercy on you, whether you realize it or not. I didn't just dump it all on you one time. I, over the last year and a half... I brought you a message here and a message there and a message here to try to lay a little bit of the mental, theological, emotional, heart foundation before I started getting into the real nitty gritty of these issues. But folks, I am convinced in my own heart that the truth that I've given you over these last few weeks have a tremendous bearing on the future of our country for good or for bad. And if we are following bad doctrine as a church, and if we are following a devilish foreign policy as a country, we are going to reap the consequences both spiritually and politically for our disobedience. In the box, out of the box, traditional, non-traditional, doesn't matter. The future of our children and grandchildren, our very freedoms are at stake. And I'm firmly convinced that the issues that I've been bringing to you over the last few weeks directly relate to those issues of freedom. And that the reason we're losing our liberties is because of the dereliction of duty to those responsibilities that we have to the principles of truth. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Don't do anything out of anger. Don't do anything out of bitterness. Don't do anything because you're trying to get at someone. Don't do anything out of a, out of a, a, a spirit that is ought with your fellow brother or sister in the Lord, or anyone else for that matter. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Vain glory means someone that's puffed up, someone who's proud, someone who's arrogant, someone who is trying to promote himself above other people. I'm smarter than they are. I'm better than they are. I'm more spiritual than they are. Let me prove it to you. Let nothing be done with the attitude of strife, friction, bitterness, anger, or vainglory, pride, arrogancy. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So do you really believe the person sitting next to you is better than you are? If you have the humble spirit of Christ, you, you do. And it's not phony, it's not contrived, it's not faked. I can understand why Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. The apostle Paul, the chief of sinners, really? Well, Paul knew his own heart. He saw the sinfulness of his own heart, the things that nobody else saw but God. 
all he could see with everyone else is just what he could see. That's all I can see with you. All I can see with you is what I see. Oh my. <laughs> just kidding. All I can see is the outward. Man looketh on the outward appearance. But I can see my own heart. I don't like what I see. I see sin. I see disobedience. I see carnality. I see unholiness. I see a lot of nasty things. And if you don't see a lot of nasty things when you look inside, hmm, what does that say? Let each esteem other better than themselves. The only one I'm going to quote from today is Albert Barnes. But I've got a, I've got a few of his quotes that were just too good to pass up. Verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife, he says, with a spirit of contention. This command forbids us to do anything or attempt anything as the mere result of strife. This is not the principle from which we are to act or by which we are to be governed. We are to form no plan and aim at no object which is to be secured in this way. The command prohibits all attempts to secure anything over others by mere physical strength or by superiority of intellect or numbers. These guys wrote, <laughs> man, these guys wrote good. Prohibits all attempts to secure anything over others by physical strength, okay, so you're stronger than the guy, or by superiority of intellect, okay, you're smarter than the guy, or by numbers. I got more guys on my side. It had nothing to do with it. it. had nothing to do with how physically strong you are. And it has nothing to do with how intellectually superior you are. And it has nothing to do with how many people you got on your side. Nothing. And anybody who operates from that Motivation is operating from the motivation of sin and wickedness. He goes on, or as the result of dark schemes and plans formed by rivalry, or by the indulgences of angry passions, or with the spirit of ambition, we are not to attempt to do anything merely by outstripping others, or by showing that we have more talent, courage, or zeal. What we are to do is, is by principle and with a desire to maintain the truth and glorify God. And yet, how often is this rule violated? How often do Christian denominations attempt to outstrip each other and to see which shall be the greatest? How often do ministers preach with no better aim? How often do we attempt to outdo others in dress, in the splendor of furniture and equipment? How often, even in plans of benevolence and in the cause of virtue and religion, is the secret aim to outdo others? This is all wrong. There's no holiness in any such effort. Never once did the Redeemer act from such a motive. And never once should this mo motive be allowed to influence us. Close quote. Wow. That one paragraph alone could revolutionize 99% of the churches in America. Verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Here's what Albert Barnes has to say about this. Some of you are going to really like this. It is the duty of every man to do this. No one is at liberty to live for himself or to disregard 
the wants of others. The object of this rule is to break up the narrow spirit of selfishness and to produce a benevolent regard for the happiness of others in respect to the rule we may observe. Number one, we are not to be busybodies in the concerns of others. Two amens. Oh, I know where next Sunday's message is coming from. We are not to be busybodies in the concerns of others. We are not to attempt to pry into their secret purposes. Every man has his own plans and thoughts and intentions, which no other one has a right to look into. Nothing is more odious than a meddler in the concern of others. Pause. Our entire television programming today in entertainment for the most part is centered around prying and meddling in other people's business. Most of the reality shows in one way or the other flaunt the meddling and prying into other people's business and it has created an entire nation of meddlers and busybodies and the church is no exception Albert Barnes goes on number two we are not to obtrude our advice where it is not sought unsolicited advice is never appreciated I have all kinds of people that come to discuss things with me. And some people will discuss for as much, as much time as I would give them. I gave them 15 minutes, they'd 15 minutes. If I gave them 30, if I gave them an hour, it'd be an hour. And when, the, when we were done discussing, they never ask a single question. Most people don't want advice. They're looking for somebody who will agree with the decision they have already made. That's what they're looking for. If that's what you're looking for, don't come to see me. It's a waste of time. You've already made your decision. You don't need my input or anyone else's. If advice is not sought, it's not appreciated. Don't try to tell people what to do when they have not asked you what to do. Let them go ahead and do what they're going to do and make their own mistakes and reap the consequences. Because they're going to do it anyway. We are not to obtrude our advice where it is not sought or at unreasonable times and places, even if the advice is itself good. Even if you're telling them the truth. If they're not open to it, if they don't want it, if they didn't solicit to it, it will do them nothing. You're casting pearls before swine at that point. No one likes to be interrupted to hear advice, and I have no right to require that he should suspend his business in order that I may give him my counsel. He hasn't asked. You have no right to give it. Number three, we... Oh, yeah, did I tell you this was written back in the 1800s? I told you that, right? Okay. We are not to find fault with what pertains exclusively to him. We are to remember that there are some things which are his business, not ours. And we are to learn to possess our souls in silence. Excuse me, in patience. If he does not give just as much as we think he ought, to benevolent objects, or if he dresses in a manner not to please our taste, or if he indulges in things which do not accord exactly with our views, 
he may see reasons for his conduct which we do not. It is possible that 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 be may right, and that if we understand the whole case, we should think and act as he would. We often complain of a man because he does not give as much as we think he ought to objects of charity. And it is possible that he may be miserably narrow. But it's also possibly that he may be more embarrassed than we know of, or that he may just then have demands against him which we are ignorant, or that he may have numerous poor relatives dependent on him, or that he gives much with the left hand which is not known by the right hand. At any rate, it is his business, not ours. And we are not qualified to judge until we understand the whole case. By the way, thank, we all ought to thank God that when we stand before the judge, I mean, as, as serious as that's going to be, and perhaps as even scary that might be, we still ought to thank God that when we stand before the judge of heaven, it's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ and not our Christian brethren or our kinfolk. That was a good spot to say amen, by the way, in case, you, in case you didn't know what that was. Number four, we are not to be gossips about the concerns of others. We are not to hunt up small stories and petty scandals respecting their families. We are not to pry into domestic affairs and divulge them abroad and find pleasure in circulating small things from house to house. There are domestic secrets which are not to be betrayed, and there is scarcely an offense of a meaner or more injurious character than to divulge to the public what we have seen a family whose hospitality we have enjoyed. Well, there goes Facebook. <laughs> but what's amazing about Facebook is what people will tell about themselves on Facebook. I don't, I don't get that at all. Don't get that at all. Oh, here I am, a total blooming idiot. Give me proof. <laughs> Look, look, everybody, I'm a moron! Bang. I don't get I don't get it. Man, oh man. Number five, where Christian duty and kindness require us to look into the concerns of others, there should be the most, utmost, excuse me, delicacy. Even children have their own secrets and their own plans and amusements on a small scale, quite as important to them as the greater games which, which we are playing in life. And they will feel the meddlesomeness of a busybody to be as odious to them as we should in our plans. A delicate parent, therefore, who has undoubtedly a right to know all about his children, will not rudely intrude into their privacies or meddle with their concerns. So when we visit the sick, while we show a tender sympathy for them, we should not be too uh, particular in inquiring into the maladies or their feelings. So when those with whom we sympathize have brought their calamities on themselves by their own fault, we should not ask too many questions about it. We should not too closely examine one who's made poor by intemperance or who is in prison for a crime. This, this is what Paul is talking about. This is the spirit of love. This is the spirit of unity. This is the bond of peace. This is the consolation of Christ. This is a foreign language to us. Did you see that? Or who is in prison for a crime? I, over the last couple of months or so since I've been delving into these controversial issues, I can say this with an absolute fact. This is not hyperbole. This is not dramatism. This is a fact. 
there are tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of professing Christians across this country who, if they had the legal, the legal authority to do it, would put every one of us in jail for the rest of our lives or would put us up against a concrete wall and would shoot us to death. And they would claim that they're loving God while they're doing it. That is not an exaggeration. Here, this Christian scholar is saying even when someone goes to prison, it's not our place to judge him. It's not our place to condemn him in our hearts. It's not our place to show him anything except the spirit of Christ. How can Christians be so bloodthirsty? I had a Christian say to me not too many weeks ago, calls himself, I mean, calls himself a Christian, professes Christ just like we do. And he said with all seriousness, Chuck, I believe every Muslim person on the face of the earth should be destroyed, killed, and wiped off the planet. I said, really? Really? Every man, woman, child, Every Muslim on the face of the earth, no matter where they are, they ought to be wiped off the face of the earth. And I said, and that's in Jesus' name, right? Where does that come from, folks? It's coming from our pulpits. It's coming from our politicians. It's coming from Lindsey Graham. It's coming from John McCain. It's coming from Fox News. It's coming from Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity. Oh, they may not say it in exactly those terms, but the same spirit is promulgated 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, all over this country. Jesus warned the church that whenever they lost their first love, they better repent or he was going to come quickly and remove the candlestick. I'm telling you, the church is in a very, very precarious situation today. We need to be very careful that having lost our love, not only for Christ, but for the souls of men, all men, the Lord doesn't come and remove our candlestick. And when he does it, who knows how he would do it. We should not too, back to Albert Barnes, we should not too closely examine or who is made poor by intemperance or who is in prison. And so when we go to sympathize with those who have been by a reverse of circumstances reduced from affluence to penury, we should not ask too many questions. We should let them tell their own story. If they voluntarily make us their confidants and tell us all about their circumstances, it is well. But let us not drag out the circumstances or wound their feelings by our impertinent inquiries or our indiscreet sympathy in their affairs. There are always secrets which the sons and daughters of misfortunes would wish to keep to themselves. This busybody, nosy spirit is killing our churches. It's killing us. You don't have to know everything about the person sitting next to you. It's none of your business. 
unless they choose to make it your business. That's what those verses are all about. Now, let this mind be in you, the contrast which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's the spirit that we should have in our hearts. The spirit of humility. The spirit of servanthood. The spirit that God has given me a a place to serve. That I should be the best servant that I can be in the body where God has placed me. That I have the, the mind of Christ, the attitude of obedience and faithfulness, even at the cost of my own death. My life is not mine. I'm bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He purchased you on the cross with his own blood. He has a plan and a purpose for us. We must do it to the best of our ability, as humbly and as faithfully as we know how, no matter what the hardship, no matter what the adversity might be. Even if it costs us our death, so be it. There is no greater calling than to die for the cause for which God has given us. What's the old saying? A coward dies a thousand deaths, a brave man but once. Wherefore, verse 9, God hath all that highly exalted him, Christ, and given him a name that is above every name, and this really is the focus of the message, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, in the heavenly world, in the earthly world, and in the demonic world. Every knee should bow. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ladies and gentlemen, there is coming a day when these verses will be fulfilled in the heart of every person who has ever lived. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That includes the politicians and the globalists and even some of the preachers. Every knee shall bow. The name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given among men. For by we must be saved. I'm not trying to, I'm really truly not trying to beat a dead horse. I'm not trying to further anything. It, I, it comes up. It's amazing once, it's amazing once you discover a truth. how often that truth presents itself as you go through the scriptures. Before you recognized the truth, you didn't notice it, and you went right over it. But then whenever you notice the truth, it keeps popping up over and over again. So then I'm in that awkward spot of, well, okay, there it is again. So do I just pass over it? Or do I just, I, but I'm not good at that. Passing over, I mean. So, I'll just say it. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Every, every person must go to the Father 
through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man. Lineage, heritage, ancestry, nationality, ethnicity, race, education, family, means nothing. Everybody is equal at the cross of Jesus Christ. And let me show you where this where bad doctrine will lead you. Let me just illustrate what is happening on a national scale that's impacting international politics that is rooted in unscriptural theology. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. But not everyone believes that. Not everyone involved in America's foreign policy believes that. Not everyone in our State Department believes that. Not everyone in our CIA believes that. Not everyone in British intelligence believes that. Not everyone in Saudi Arabia believes that. Not everyone in the Mossad believes that. Not every preacher in America's pulpits believes that. John Hagee, pastor Cornerstone Church in San Antonio, Texas, has become a movement. He's not just a preacher. He's a movement. He has done more to promote the theology of what they call Christian Zionism of any single man in the world. He has an international following and he's considered the champion of Israel and of Judaism. What does John Hagee believe? A few years ago, John Hagee gave a written interview to the Houston Chronicle. In that written interview, meaning that he sent the written words himself, it wasn't an audio transcript, he wrote the words himself and sent it to the newspaper. In that interview, he said that he believes that Jews already have a covenant with God and a relationship to God and do not need to come to the cross. Quote, I believe that every Jewish person who lives in the light of the Torah, that would be Genesis through Deuteronomy, who lives in the light of the Torah, which is the word of God, has a relationship with God and will come to redemption, close quote. Now in the first place, Mr. Hagee, this is the word of God. Genesis through Revelation not Genesis through Deuteronomy. He goes on. The paper said then, John Hagee, fundamentalist pastor from San Antonio, and friend of Israel, the man has a mission. He's out to attack anti-Semitism. He also believes that Jews can come to God without going through Jesus Christ. And then they quote, Hagee's own words, quote, I'm not trying to convert the Jewish people to the Christian faith, close quote. And I heard him say that myself 
at a speech he gave a couple of years ago in front of APAC. He said that very thing. He said that the Christians and the Jews were brothers, were spiritual brothers, and he said that he's not trying to convert Jews to Christianity. Well, the reason he's not is because he believes that they have a dual covenant with God, that God is going to take them to heaven just because they're Jews. Hagee goes on to say, quote, in fact, trying to convert Jews is a waste of time, his words, a waste of time. The Jewish person who has his roots in Judaism is not going to convert to Christianity. There is no form of Christian evangelism that has failed so miserably as evangelizing the Jewish people. They already have a faith structure. Everyone else, everyone else needs to believe in Jesus, but not Jews. Jews already have a covenant with God that has never been replaced by Christianity, close quote. That is serious heresy. Serious heresy. Mr. Hagee has convinced millions of Christians around the country of this heresy. And they're forming their political opinions related to America's foreign policy, especially in the Middle East, on those erroneous philosophies. And much of what we hear regurgitated on Fox News relative to the Middle East and much of what we hear coming from the pulpits of America, and much of what we hear coming from the, quote, conservative Republican Party, including the vast majority of the candidates for president, regurgitate this heresy, or at least are predicated on this heresy. You think that doesn't have a serious impact upon our country's future? Who lives and who dies? War and peace, generation to generation, liberty and tyranny. You think that doesn't have an impact upon everything that relates to our political life? And yet that doctrine of Christian Zionism that is promoted so heavily by people like John Hagee is the catalyst for much of our foreign policy and much of the political philosophy of especially the Republican Party candidates. No wonder Charles Finney said over 100 years ago, as the pulpits go, so goes America. No wonder as the church goes, so goes the country. I put up on my website the seven-minute debate, if you want to call it that, between Sean Hannity and Pat Buchanan. I hope you go to my website and look at it. First thing you're going to notice is Sean Hannity interrupting constantly Pat Buchanan. Pat hardly had a chance to even say a sentence without Sean jumping all over him, interrupting him, and not letting him speak. That's the first thing you're going to notice. The second thing you're going to notice is the tremendous common sense historical accuracy and, dare I say, even biblical reality of Pat Buchanan's responses. but he was treated like a nincompoop. Pat Buchanan, one of the smartest, most principled patriots America has seen in a couple of generations. Sean tried to make him look like a nincompoop. 
He didn't. In my opinion, Pat Buchanan made Sean Hannity look like a nincompoop. But you, you watch it and judge for yourself. But you will see what I'm talking about right here, holding out this example of John Hagee and his heresy regarding Jesus Christ as Savior of the world and all man's accountability to him, including those of Judaism, come alive in that debate on Fox News. If you understand what you're looking at and you understand what I'm trying to teach you here when you watch that and from now on when you watch anything like it, the light is going to come on and you're going to know exactly what you're seeing. Do you know that a couple of years ago the state of Israel made it legal that a young woman may abort her baby even through the third trimester? Full grown, fully developed fetuses may be legally, and by the way, the government of Israel will pay for these abortions. Every baby in the womb in the state of Israel may be aborted at any time during their development, even until the ninth month, the end of the pregnancy. And the state of Israel will also pay for that abortion. Did you know that? Where are our pro-life Christian leaders in America to highlight this travesty? Talk about the Muslims. Have you seen what an aborted baby looks like? Sometimes they kill them by dissecting the baby into small pieces with a surgical instrument. Sometimes they'll use a saline injection and they will burn the baby alive. Sometimes they will suck the baby out of the womb with a vacuum cleaner type instrument. Have you ever seen what an aborted fetus looks like in the garbage can of an abortuary? It makes beheading look mild. A reporter went to some of our pro-life Republicans for responses and here's some of the responses. Senator Lindsey Graham said, they, Israel, are sovereign nation. They can do as they wish, close quote. Really? Really, Lindsey? Israel's a sovereign nation, so it can do what it wants. Well, wait a minute. Isn't Iran a sovereign nation? Why can't it do what it wants? Isn't Syria a sovereign nation? Why can't it do what it wants? You're the one advocating bombing those two countries back into the Stone Age. But they're sovereign nations. They can do what they want. No, you only can do what you want whenever you're on the good graces of the neocons in Washington, D.C. If you're not in the good graces of the neocons in Washington, D.C., then you're not a sovereign nation, and you can't do anything without the permission of our State Department. Is this tough for you to take, folks? Is this tough for you to take? I'm telling you the gospel truth here. Senator Marco Rubio declined to weigh in on the issue citing unfamiliarity. Senator Ted Cruz referred the reporters to his press office and the press office spokeswoman did not return a request for comment. John McCain said, I don't feel qualified to talk about what Israel should be doing on abortion. Well, you're a you're qualified to talk about everything else, Senator. 
It's amazing, all of a sudden, the ignorance now you have about this one issue. Wow. You're such a genius on everything else. Family Research Council, pro-life, national organization, national right to life. How many other family foundations, uh, pro-life foundations across the country? Not one word about the abortion law in Israel. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. God is no respecter of persons. And it doesn't matter to him whether a nation is politically correct or not. And it doesn't matter to him whether it's part of the globalist new world order or not. And it doesn't matter to him whether the Rothschilds are pouring billions of dollars behind it or not. It doesn't matter to him what the U.S. media or Fox News thinks about it. It doesn't matter to him, sorry, it doesn't matter to God what John Hagee or Chuck Baldwin have to say about it. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Is it amazing how we twist the scripture to make it fit our political agendas? One, I get criticism all the time. No kidding. I get, and they, they roll off my back like water on a duck's back. They really do. They really do. I, I don't accept one. There's one that, and now that I've said it, I'm sure I'm going to get a bunch of it this week. It just irks me to no end. And a guy said it recently on my Facebook post. Well, you, you hear Chuck Baldwin preach, you don't hear any Bible, all you hear is politics. Oh, that grates on me. Every sermon I preach, every Bible study I teach is on the, uh, is on the web. And I challenge anybody to go on the web and watch any sermon or Bible study that I preach and show me and tell me how I don't preach the word of God in every single message. The problem is, the problem, wait, the problem is, the difference between me and most of the other preachers is that I take the word of God and I apply it to the principles of politics or commerce or whatever it might happen to be in our daily affairs and take the application of the Bible to those issues. That's the difference. That's the difference. They won't apply it. For example, verse 15. Oh, by the way, that's so much I'm, I'm having to go over here. Wow, I'm out of time. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Verse 13, I love that verse. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. When you give your heart to the Lord, he works in you and he works out of you or through you of his good pleasure. I love. I just love that. You can get a hold of that, folks. It'll be a blessing. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. How we doing, folks? <laughs> when our kids were small, especially after Tim came along, That verse became very popular in the Baldwin home. <laughs> Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now they don't live under my roof anymore, thank God. <laughs> so I asked the fellowship, how did we do? How did we do? Do all things <laughs> without murmuring and disputings. Boy, one of the things that most people are really good at, I mean, they've got a PhD in it, is murmuring and disputing. 
complaining, griping. Oh, 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 oh. Do all things, all things, without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless, harmless, not sinless, because none of us are, except through Christ. The sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. I hate to say it, but America is becoming more and more crooked and more and more perverse by the day. Oh, man, folks, it's horrible. I mean, I'm, I'm not like some of these Christians in the way they react to certain political issues, but I got to tell you, the way the God-haters are trying to extinguish Christianity from America is unbelievable, quite honestly. It's, it's unbelievable. I'm looking at these kids and teenagers and I'm saying to myself, if God doesn't do something in this country pretty soon, oh my soul, what kind of a nation are they going to have? I mean, look at this great Republican governor and legislature in my home state of Indiana, where I was born and raised, did just recently. Caved, completely caved to the radical homosexual lobby. Completely caved. A very... It should, what should have been a basic human rights, civil rights, a basic freedom issue. It has nothing to do with, with, with homosexuality or race or any other of these issues that they try to confuse it with. It was a basic civil rights freedom issue. And they totally surrendered to the sodomite Nazis. I mean, they, they just curled up and died. Mike Pence, sir, I'm sorry. I did have a lot of respect, you, respect for you before this. As far as I'm concerned now, you're nothing but a coward. Ditto for the governor of Arkansas. Simple things. Policemen terrorizing people the population of our country routinely. Got a South Carolina policeman that just shot a, a, a man who was pulled over for a minor traffic violation. He had a taillight that was out. Pulled him over, tried to tase him. The man tried to get, run away from the tase. He was 58 years old and out of shape. He was not, not a fit and trim kind of a fellow. He was trying to run away from the police officer, and the police officer shot him eight times in the back and killed him. And it was recorded on video. Thankfully, it was recorded on video. And then after, he, after he's lying dead on the ground, he goes and handcuffs the guy. And then he goes back to the squad car, takes a taser out of the car, and drops the taser by the side of the dead body as if the, the guy had his taser and was trying to hurt the police officer. Oh, I was justified. He had a taser and he was trying to hurt me. Planted evidence. But because fortunately there was a bystander who saw it going on and had his, his, his camera on his cell phone and took video of it. And you know what? I'm to the point that I'm saying now, anytime we see a police stop, somebody ought to be taking a video of it. Amen. It's out of control. I promise you, if, that had, if there had been no video of that, the, the officer's partner would have backed him up. He would have said it was some kind of self-defense. He would have said, see, he had the taser. He tried to tase me, whatever. He would have given a side of the story. The police chief would have, pa would have passed it off, and nothing would have been done. That goes on all the time in this country. But because there was a video camera, they could not dispute what really happened, and they're charging the policeman with murder.
Let's see what kind of a sentence he gets. My prediction is he'll get about 10 years and he'll, he'll serve about two and he'll be out again. That's my prediction. We'll see. This kind of stuff is going on all the time. A perverse and crook, crooked nation. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. <laughs> as I said a minute ago, the darker it gets outside, the brighter this little light here in Kalispell, Montana is going to shine. And some of the people that right now are condemning us and condemning me and are that rating us and criticizing us and saying all manner of evil against us. Give it time. Give it time. Give it a few months. Give it a couple years. Truth is truth is truth is truth. And as these things continue to go forward, and the darkness continues to envelop the land to an even greater density. The light of truth that we're lighting right here in this valley is going to continue to glow and grow and grow and grow. As bad as they try, they cannot quench truth. They can kill Chuck Baldwin or anyone else. They can take out a man. They cannot destroy an idea. They cannot destroy a principle. They cannot destroy truth. Truth is going to win out, folks. However the process may take, truth is going to win out. And for what it's worth, just to let you know, popular or unpopular, whether I'm criticized or whether I'm lauded, whether people come into this fellowship or whether people leave this fellowship, as long as God gives me the health and the mind and this platform, I am going to preach with the best of my ability as God shines it in my heart, the truth of his word. Let's stand for prayer.